you get from landowners. Any good descriptions for them? Yes. Okay, welcome. I'm welcoming Elizabeth McCready to talk to the Helm Group, and we're here to learn all about mountain cedar and how, what, we, what we can do to advise landowners on their mountain cedar, because lots of times one of the questions that, that comes in is, what do I do about all this cedar? And uh, the tendency is to chop it all down, and that's not the right answer, but Elizabeth's going to tell us that. Yeah, well, the tendency has been to chop it all down because people have been taught for more than 50 years that it's a bad tree, that it's causing harm, it's degrading our water and our soils. And, uh, you know, when I first moved to Austin more than 25 years ago, that's what I was taught, you know, that, that they're not native, that they're sucking water and all these things. And, uh, and since I was a member of the Native Plant Society, I was like, wait, what, what, wait, it's not native? <laughs> How can you say that? And uh, so I had to look into that. And I was uh, teaching, uh, leading uh, trail guides at the Wild Basin at the time. And if I'm going to be taking people around, I need to know. And uh, the, uh, the director of the Wild Basin hooked me up with Brother Daniel Lynch, who is the head of biology at uh, St. Edward's University, who was doing specialized studies on uh, mountain cedars also called ash juniper. In my book, I explain I call them mountain cedars because that's what the early settlers called them. And they didn't start calling it ash juniper until the 1930s. And I thought, I'm, I'm just going to go with the old name, mainly trying to get people to overcome this derogatory, it's a cedar. We need to stop calling it a cedar. Because when you call it a cedar, you're implying, what are you talking about, all junipers? Or are you talking about just the cedar that's growing here in the hill country? And uh, by calling it mountains here, when you call, talk about eastern red cedars or aromatic cedars, you don't just call them cedar. It's like it, when you give it a more personalized name, it makes it look more important right away. You know what I'm saying? As opposed to, oh, that damn cedar. And you don't have to cut that out. That's uh, <laughs> <insane. laughs> So, I, you know, the other reason I call them mountain cedars, and this is warrants more research, is that Dr. Robert Adams, uh, formerly, formerly, formerly with uh, uh, Baylor University, he believes that there's at least two, possibly three different uh, species of juniper in the hill country. Okay, so that we have the ash juniper, and then we have juniper zavada, which does not grow right around here. It is uh, an ancestral relic from the Ice Age. So anyone who goes telling you that junipers are not native, have not been here long, you tell them, well, they've been growing since the Ice Age. It is my theory, and I discussed it with Adams, that junipers ashii evolved around 8,000 years ago. It might have been here longer, but it's very possible that that happened because we had sudden kind of fluxes in the climate that could have spurred the development of a new species. But it's possible that those two have been hybridizing which would explain a lot, as I'm hoping to actually be able to show you, and, and I'm going to have to find what I'm talking about in order to show it to you. But the first thing we need to do is how do you go up to a landowner and you try to get them to change their negative uh, view? And let's just start off over here. So one of the things is that people will go through and they'll either clear cut all the cedars as they did beyond the fence, because they're told that they're not native, I've already have explained, yes, they are native, or that they are sucking all the water. Also, if you have livestock, you know, it's getting in the way of the, of the grass, right? So what we need to do is try to explain to people, why are these trees here? Now, y'all were talking about weeds. Sure. And a lot of people will consider mountain cedars to be weeds. Weeds are viewed as useless, right? But what is a hackberry? A hackberry, a lot of people say, is a weed because it pops up everywhere in my yard and it's hard to control. But guess what it is? It's an early succession species. It is trying to reestablish a forest or a woodland. And so it comes up, and I've been doing this in my own backyard. I've been doing what's called rewilding. It's that you just kind of pull away the lawnmower and you see what nature wants it to be. And as it comes up, it was that first flush of the first year, you get lots of Bermuda grass. But that's okay, because I knew it was going to eventually turn into more like a elm. Um, 
Hackberry uh, Forest based on the fact that you look at adjacent areas that are natural and you can get clues from that. So that was my educated guess and sure enough the hackberries they came up they created the shade for the cedar elms to come up underneath that but something more is going on under the ground and this is all new research city of austin has just started a new research grant to study this the mycorrhizal fungi and it's ver very likely and i don't know enough about hackberry elm relationships but I guarantee you, as that hackberry gets started, that is establishing a type of mycorrhizal fungi that will then allow the seed around to come up. And then guess what comes up after that? I've got tickle tongue coming up, you know, Texas ash popping up, a Brazil tree popping up. I didn't plant any of this. It's already there or it's being brought in by the birds. And Elizabeth, that's one of the problems is sometimes it looks messy when it's starting and people think it looks yes. messy. Nature is messy. It gets less messy over time. When, you, when you look at photographs of the Comal and Pernaus River taken in the 1860s, uh, you'll see beaver. I, there's one that has a beaver swimming down the, the river. It's messy. And it's like after, it, there's like debris, it's like over, uh, overgrown. You know, that word overgrown has become so taboo. And on the way here, we, I passed some creeks and they're just scalped. The land is scalped. And you want that dense vegetation, but we've been taught since the 1940s that less is better. The clean look is in. And you hear that all over, especially in the cities. This uh, idea that we have to create cosmos out of perceived chaos. And, uh, and the same can be applied to the mountain cedars. They are viewed as creating chaos as they spread. They're not doing what we want them to do. And so therefore, they're either clear cut like in, the, in there, or people come, they prune them all up. And guess what happens when you prune them up? The deer eat everything underneath them because these act as nursery trees. And I have found all kinds of plants that are coming up underneath. The other thing that, um, this is what I call are the, the bushy cedars. If you've read my book, I call, I say, pioneering thickets of bushy cedars. And mountain cedars are unique in that they can be both a climax old growth species, but also has the ability to come out here. Or there's a possibility that that is ash juniper and the stuff in the old growth is the hybrid. But that's just a theory. But it could explain a lot, right? But we don't know for sure. But that is some research I would definitely like to be able to find out. In any case, when that ash juniper mountain cedar starts to spread across do you see all this exposed rock that's degraded you don't want to see this much exposed rock that hard scrabble everyone seems to be proud of not to be proud of if you have cow chips in your pasture you have degraded soil there should not be any dry cow chips on top of your soil because you should have dung beetles that are moving it down deep into the soil what happens what do you got there soil. Oh, soil. <laughs> Yeah, but the thing is, is that when the soil gets degraded, and it gets, especially when it gets severely degraded, that, uh, that mycorrhizal fungi, it goes dormant. So you just get the spores in the soil and nothing else can grow. Have you ever seen a live oak come out and colonize an area like this? No, because they can't do it. And new research with the city of Austin is showing the Balcones Canyonland Preserve Group that this uh, that when these spread as pioneering trees they actually activate the arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi once that's activated then the live oaks can come in they kind of prefer the ectomycorrhizal but they can they also like the uh, arbuscular but they can't activate it the oak trees need the pioneering bushy cedars in order to get reestablished do they eventually, after they're bushy like this, would this eventually, depending on what happens in the soil, that it becomes, some cedars are very tall trees. Like yeah, that. we're going to get to that. Okay. So, um, <laughs> so the, the, fungi, the fungi that, that's uh, dormant or comes back, is that for all woody uh, trees and plants or just the live oak? No, no, all plants. Okay. All plants. In, in fact, uh, you know, someone was talking about you know, like live oaks and oak wilt. And if there's enough of the uh, mycorrhizal fungus in the soil, the soil's really healthy, that fungus will wrap around and coat each of the roots and will protect it from oh, oak wilt. Nice. Okay? 
So, and so if you go, what now? I was going to say there's other oaks that are also dependent. Absolutely. Yeah. And, it, they, and the fungus acts as like straws on your fingertips and that it helps you access even more nutrients and stuff beyond the, the limit of just your, your roots. And so it kind of increases your root mass, basically. So it's healthy. And so everything should be about increasing the mycorrhizal fungi. You know, that, that should be kind of a primary focus instead of focusing on a tree. You know, it's like we need to turn our focus to the soil to see really why are they spreading? Why are they here? Why do they keep, you know, uh, someone earlier said, oh, I cut them down. They just keep coming back. I'm like, yeah. because the soil needs it. It's like they're, they're absolutely necessary. Now, does that mean we can't step in and understand what's happening and do some things to help speed it up? There's absolutely no reason why we can't do that. And like one of the things that I like to do are contour bioswales, especially on these slopes where you uh, do like a 12 inch deep tr uh, trench with a, you pile up the berm, the cut soil just down slope. And it, you, if you don't have the funds, you could even do this with windrows, you know, using any cut brush. So you cut these openings through very, very desiccated, dehydrated uh, slopes. And when it rains, it, it hits that, and it, it's like a linear retention pond, and it gets that water back into the soil. And let me explain why that's important. It's because we're on top of what's called karst geology. Y'all as master natural should know, but for the, the kind uh, audience here uh, that may not know, is that uh, the limestone, and if, as you can see here, it, it's like this would have been like a little hole or something like that, you know, is that, the limestone is uh, made of a, a, a carbonate rock. And when the rain falls from the sky, the rain picks up car atmospheric carbon and it, it creates carbonic acid, a very kind of low intensity acid. When it hits the limestone, that is what over millions of years carves out caves and creates thems and all the, you know, the dripping things. Um, but if that carbonic acid cannot get into the ground, it runs off, that's what happens to the cars. It clogs up and it becomes compacted and it loses that porosity. Now the caves will stay, but I'm talking about the upper part of the cars called the epicars. And that is the area that is most crucial to keep the most, like keep it as porous as possible. And that is what these mountain cedars are doing. Okay, so Brad Wilcox with Texas A&M just published a paper, and I can get you all the link if you need it, uh, that is showing that the infiltration of rain under, e just even just the pioneering thickets is higher than where you have sparse, you know, just degraded conditions, significantly higher. That the movement of water underneath these pioneering thickets is substantially higher, which means they're not only activating that fungi, but they're also increasing the porosity, uh, reestablishing uh, epicars function. And for that reason, they're very valuable. It's just the opposite from what people thought, that they stole water, right. they're actually contributing. <laughs> well, and the thing is, is like uh, people like uh, certain people uh, have said that when they clear their, their cedars, mm -hmm. that the springs will start to flow. Well, the reason for that is because the, water, uh, the, the trees have improved the infiltration. If you take them away, then all 100% of the water is going to hit the ground. That will be, last for about three to five years, and then those springs start to go away. The only reason you get that surge in the springs is because you've removed all the vegetation and there's zero water use at all, and that would happen with any species of plant. And so it gives the perception that, oh, I took them out, my springs gushed up, but that's because people have not been thinking enough about what's going on underneath the ground, you know, down under. And, and, and I didn't for the first 15 years of my research. It was only in the last five, especially during the pandemic, when I became really introverted. <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, they, I, may, I started thinking like a cave dweller, you know, and I, once I really started to doing, doing cross sections, I started to understand this is the bigger picture. This is what's so important. In fact, some uh, karst geologists consider the vegetation itself to be part of the epicarst. And so it's vital to have it as dense and thick as possible. Now, that becomes a problem, again, if you have some livestock, right? 
And, and for people who are trying to manage, it's like you're going to have to find sections that you can go in to try to boost up your infiltration, but also areas that could be cleared a little bit to increase uh, grass production. Those will eventually degrade, but hopefully by the time that those degrade, that old first area that you did will be much better. So you kind of have to kind of sequence things and phase things out. But the truth is, we have really messed up the hill country. And at this point, restoring it is really should take precedence. And that's why there are more and more grant and funding opportunities coming available to do things like moving that water in deeper. But first thing we have to do is to cancel out more than 50 years uh, it, like back in the 1900s, you, you read any report from like the latest one was 1915 that said that, oh, trees are, are what get the water into the ground. But by the 1940s, that whole thing had flip-flopped. And now they were saying, oh, no, you had to clear all your trees so we can get more runoff to fill the, you know, the aquifers oh, by using overland method. I'm like, no, it's been under the ground for all these years, and yet because they flip-flopped, as Steve Nelly said, it's led to a, the great desertification of the hill country. Let's go okay. One of the things that I did before I came out here is that I looked at the, looked up the web soil. Who knows about the, the web soil? Do you know about that? It's that online service where you can zoom into a property, and uh, it'll show you the types of soils that you have. Yeah, and the, the main thing I look at is how deep is it? <clears throat> and anything, and most, uh, most often the soils around here specifically uh, range from four to maybe about 15 inches deep. That's shallow. And it will actually do better if covered with trees until it's uh, restored. Now, it doesn't mean it has to all be trees. You can obviously have grass, but, you know, it, uh, so you have like little patches like this, but even just having this much rock exposed, that, that shows that the grass is not doing a good job. But that might be because it's being mowed, you know, which would be the same thing as grazing. Uh -huh. You know, I would think so. Uh, yeah, that's what the leaves look like. I thought at first it might be a red oak, but it's not. But it's interesting how it's grown. No, this is how they grow, is that if you cut them down, because shin oaks are what form the black hat vario habitat, and it's for this reason that they thick it. If you have shin oaks, it should be trees. And that is another thing to know about is, yeah, 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 is that shin oaks, if you have uh, shin oaks growing and Texas red oaks, that's an indicator that it should be trees. Uh, if you uh, see like lots of cedar sedge, trees. If you see a sun like a big patch of like a Lindheimer muley, grass. You know, you learn to look for these indicator species that will kind of give you clues of if it should be trees or not. And if you have a whole bunch of, uh, of shin oaks, yeah, it's going to make really bad for a ranching land. It's not good for grazing. It's, it's going to be a struggle always to try to keep the grass growing. Where does the elms fall in that, uh, you know, as far as they're, they're mixed in with cedar? Uh, if you see a big patch of cedar elm, it usually means there's a lot of subsurface moisture, and typically that would occur in an area that could have a lot of grass in it. Okay. Yeah. If it's in a forest area. Now, if it's in a forest area mixed in, then it's just it's a, okay. it's a happy tree. Four, Do you have a cheat, a cheat sheet of indicator plants? Uh, in my book. Oh, perfect. <laughs> okay. I do want to try to get, like, maybe based off of this, is to try to get, like, a little, a little uh, pocket book that someone could take around and use oh, as a cheat sheet, to, you know, all these that's different things. Okay. Yeah, so that's what I'm hoping to kind of pull off of this. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> However, I'm kind of surprised that there's no green growth yet on here. Did it freeze back? Uh... We didn't, it, yeah. Unless they unless they've cut it back so many times that it's no longer growing. Oh, uh, just a little story, and this is kind of funny. Uh, Chuck Sexton with the uh, National Wildlife, uh, uh, you know, what is it, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, when he was working out the Balcones Canyonland uh, National Wildlife Refuge, he said that they had one landowner that they were trying, oh, please, 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 we want to acquire your land, we want to acquire it, and, there's, and he's holding out, holding out, and he had golden cheek warblers, and they said, oh, but you have all these warblers, and he said, 
And so he went and he cut down all of his mountain cedars so it wouldn't be qualified as a uh, warbler habitat. And guess what grew up? Chinooks and it became black cat burial habitat, oh. which was also <laughs> endangered. <laughs> and he, he said he just gave up. So here, take it. <laughs> And ant lions, these are a, a tiny little part of the soil biology that helps to kind of move the uh, organic matter down into the soil. But you don't see these until the soil starts to get more established. Oh, really? That's fascinating. <coughs> How does it to be so bare right here? Uh, probably just people walking by and wind. Okay. It looks more like a wind thing. Cause I to see and maybe there's some even some. Yeah, yeah I think it's just because it's right on the edge of here. here too, it's hard to tell. Uh, probably. So, that was just the land uh, ant lions yeah, are being persistent, though. <laughs> yeah. See here how the uh, how the tree is acting as a nursery to protect. <clears throat> so we got here was that yopon. So the yopon would be probably eaten by the deer, but it's being protected. It's a living cage. So that's why I don't want to prune up everything. Okay. I found that deer don't like so right here, do you see that? Mm -hmm. Now a lot of people will come and get their loppers. They'll say, ah, oh, loppers. No, those are stick cedars. These are the ones, see how this is a bushy cedar. Do you see how it's all branched at the bottom and all that? It's real sticky and all that. These are the ones that are going to come up where you already have the, the, uh, the, uh, the fungus in the soil going. You have the healthier soils. And they will come up in shade a lot of times, but sometimes they come up in full sun, which makes me wonder, uh, are they a hybrid? Because, or is it just simply better soil allows them to grow straighter with a, a single trunk being green. protected? <laughs> so back in here, these are the, uh, yeah, so this is like another, uh, this is a little more bushy though. Sometimes you'll have some of the bushy ones kind of mixed in, like you see some bushies over there. The stick cedars have a really, really well-defined central trunk. And those are the ones that, oh, here we go. OK, here we go. Look, this is great. This is a great <coughs> example. Do you see how there's a lot of them coming up together? Right. Now, sometimes, sometimes you'll see so many, there'll be like 50 coming up, all packed and tight like sardines. And people think, oh, we have to get rid of all of them. But the truth is, stick cedars are a normal part of hill country, woodland, and forest uh, regeneration. <laughs> it doesn't mean that you can't thin out a few, you know, like ones coming right at the base of a live oak, you know, but it needs to be taught that something like this, this is going to grow into a good so tree. I, a little I think you called it <laughs> dog hair growth. Yeah, now when you see it where there has been a disturbance, now this is just them coming up. There's a few more here. But when you see like 20 to 50 or so coming up in the area where there's no canopy above and they're coming up really dense, like aspen trees would come up, you know, following an avalanche or something like that, then I call that dog hair regrowth. And that is a typical thing applied to like conifer trees that come up real dense. And there they're coming up, coming up because there's nothing there. They're trying to prevent de degradation. <laughs> Again, we can go in and thin out the weakest and the smallest and kind of give them a little bit more space, but continue keeping the canopy. We want to keep the canopy continuous. And, and that's another thing to kind of mention here is that a woodland is about 60 or anywhere from 40 to maybe about 75 percent uh, continuous canopy above. The forest is going to be up to 100 percent. So, you know, you kind of want to know, do you want to have that? Do you want to have a forest or a woodland? In this case, it looks more like a woodland because you have a lot more openings in the canopy. So right now, this is a woodland. And you have to also, the thing is also is that you don't, uh, a lot of times people will prune up the mountain cedars because they want all this grass to grow underneath it. But that's a huge fire hazard. That's a significant fire hazard unless the, tree, the grass growth is within, like in the middle of the forest or in the middle of a woodland. <clears throat> but when you uh, have like trees out there by themselves and you're limbing them up to get that grass to grow underneath, you don't want that. And that's because our trees are short. We don't have these tall trees. You know, like the pine trees where the grasses grow underneath, like in a bastra, those canopies start, you know, like 40 feet up. And here our trees get 40 feet tall. <laughs> so there, and when these grasses they they get real dense they start to burn they're going to be throwing up fl flames that are three to six feet high and that's just going to torch this one out so you got to be careful about that but if you you can have the grass growing in around
but it's better to have it surrounded by an area where there isn't very much grass. And that's why, like, on the edge, <coughs> do you see here how the edge here has no grass? This is the edge between the open grass area and the interior. You do, and that's perfect. So you want that edge to be as dense as possible. That's where you want your density. Once you're inside the forest or inside the woodland, people can open it up a little bit more to get little patches of prairies and glades and meadows and things like that. But you have to have that. That is your fire barrier. Okay? It's a land riparian area. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, Mich Michelle Burleson did, did a uh, prescribed burn uh, talk for us at our last chapter meeting. And she showed pictures of how the fire went up to yeah. the edge of the woodland, may have sinked a few things <coughs> in that. Yeah, the, um, it burned itself out, isn't it? Really? Yeah, and they found that a lot you know, at the Balcones Canelands, at the uh, Kerrville Wildlife Center with Bill Armstrong, um, is, that, is that the mountain cedars, as long as they're like at least 60% hydrated, which is most of the time, is that they have a very low risk of burning. And if you have just a regular fire going by, they'll be fine. The, st the reason why so many people think that they're highly flammable is because they seem dead brush burn. And that can be explosive because it's dead brush. Right. Okay? And, and Michelle said 2011, that's the exception to everything. <laughs> no. Yeah. Yeah. The drought. Because well, that drought. Because then everything was so dry. Now, the thing is also is that we don't actually, do you know that in Texas, 95% of our wildfires how do they start? <laughs> You're in my book. <laughs> and it's true. It might be common knowledge nowadays. <laughs> Ninety-five percent of our wildfires in Texas, that is, are started by humans. Probably Nashville could argue. I don't know about that, but but it's the thing is, is like uh, a friend of mine, Pat McNeil, worked. Uh, he he fought wildfires in California, and he said. We are not even close to coming close to California because we do not have the high winds and extreme dry conditions. And he said also, even as thick as some of this mountain cedar can get, he said that's not even, it's not even close to thick heat because he said there they do so much logging, the stuff that comes back, you can't even stick your hand into it. And he says that is extremely flammable. So high winds, extreme droughts, and they get the Santa Ana winds. Well, we might the hillsides, the topography there too. I think. Yeah, yeah, that makes it a little bit more. But he said that it's mainly those three things, okay. is why the hill country can't be compared. So if people are mentioning fears about fire and stuff like that, it's like it's bring up the fact that they can be used as a fire break, literally. You mentioned that three-year drought back in 2011. Yeah. Some of the cedars died. I thought it was from the spider mites being so prolific. They were under such stress. Do you know what kind? Yeah. Okay. So y'all, if y'all been driving around, you probably see, I mean, there, there's like one right there. It's like, you'll see these big masses of usually around that size. Mm -hmm. <coughs> There'll be some older ones that die, but that happens with any old tree. It wasn't just mm -hmm. mountain cedars. It was live oaks and cedar elms. It's just that we have more mountain cedars, so you see it more, right? But what is most notable is the fact that we do get large chunks. Mm -hmm. And it's just as because they haven't become established. Their roots are not deep enough. They need to get roots down about 25 feet to access the deeper epicarse water. If they haven't gotten that deep, it's going to be really hard to get through a drought. That's how it's like with live oaks. You know when you see like a huge, I don't see any around here, huge, like there might be one over there in the distance, huge live oak moths that even in the drought they never look bad. That's because their roots are about 60 to 75 feet down and they're getting into to the cave waters. That's how they survive. That's how they do it. But if, they, if the big drought comes and they haven't gotten them down, yeah, they're gonna die. Okay. And it's just, we just have to accept it. What, but what Brad Wilcox found is that they were doing a lot of their infiltration studies underneath these dead patches. They said 10 years later, the infiltration was still high. So it, it, even though it could become a fire hazard, <laughs> it still was protecting that soil and the karst underneath, which is important to kind of know about that. So let's go back. You said there's a big old one down there. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so the white bands on here is a type of fungus. And it, go, it's, it appears to be growing on the excessive sap because the um, a mountain cedar is a... Uh, it's going to be real sappy, you know, the sapwood's going to be very sappy and sticky, make a sticky bark until it's about 30 to 40 years of age. And 
the fungus is growing on that. It's growing on the sap. Yeah, because because what happens is that then as the sap goes away, the fungus goes away, and that is one way to kind of like estimate how old the tree is. You could say it's at least 30 years old because you don't see any more. Oh, that's dead, so that's why. <laughs> uh, <laughs> okay, here's one here. Do you see that? That that one is probably at least uh, 25, 30 years old because you don't see any of the, of the white fungus. But if you look at the very tips of the branches, you'll still see it up there. But it first disappears from the trunk, and then the branches, then the twigs. So if you find a large mountain cedar that has no fungus whatsoever anywhere, it's going to be an old one, you know, so that, that's just like an easy way. In fact, cedar choppers, that's how they would know when they were supposed to cut down, chop down a tree to make a good post, is that they would wait for the fungus to go away. They're like, okay, because that means the heartwood has matured. What about, you know, in some cedar thickets, the even small ones won't have that on it, and then kind of on edges they will, or in other spots, a lot of yeah, them. Yeah, they're not all, they don't all have it. Okay. It's not consistent. It's just kind of a, a, a loose you know, thing like, some of them may not have it, some of them okay. do. Mm -hmm. So this is, uh, would have been a stick cedar when it started off. It looks like it had two together that kind of can became conjoined twins here and grew up side by side. You can still see the split right there. And, uh, but here, this is about 60 in, uh, six, uh, six inches wide. And a loose rule of thumb is just six means it's 60 years old. Oh, wow. So a year, uh, inches oh. is two yeah. years? Yeah, yeah. That's just, now that's a minimum. And... I got some old trees. Yeah. <laughs> Me too. Exactly. Yeah. I have seen, yeah. that means, yeah. 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 So that's just a general rule of thumb. Obviously, if it's growing in an area that's more droughty and stuff like that, it would be growing slower. And so you multiply by 0.1 to get that one inch or 0.06. To, so it gives you a range of ages. So this would be like 60 to maybe like 150 years old. So, but, and is it because all junipers are slow growing? They may uh, spread across a degraded area quickly, but that's only because they have the ability to produce sh shitload of seeds. And uh, um, real quick on the word invasive. So I almost said the word invade because we're so used to saying that word. And you know that for hundreds of years, anything that was spreading across a ranch land or something like that, we would call it invasive, right? Then the Native Plant Society and uh, the USDA decided to change up the word invasive to mean not native. That has caused a lot of confusion. That's one of the reasons why people don't think it's native. Okay? <coughs> yeah. It's an aggressive, aggressive native. Is really well, it's not aggressive though. It's only aggressive because it has to be. Yeah. It's necessarily aggressive, but I, that's why to call it says a pioneer. And pioneering species, by their nature, are usually are aggressive. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but instead of just calling it aggressive, is that we should be calling it what it really is, a pioneering species, just like hackberries should be called an early succession species. You know, call it for what it is. And uh, it's... Uh, is it East Texas or like... College Station area are those cedars that that's Eastern Red Cedar. Okay, that's a different. Cedar. Yeah, and and I don't they get know. really fat, but I thought it was the climate. Well, it, no, oh, they, they get really they, they do get bigger. they do get bigger. Uh, Probably a better soil, right? Yeah, <laughs> they do. They have a little bit nicer conditions, not as droughty. I mean, this is tough, tough growing conditions. Any plant that can thrive, you know, I, I had a friend once who knew nothing about all of this, but all he saw was like. God damn, nothing else will grow. Why would you cut out the one thing that can grow? Oh, you know? <laughs> it's like, why do we keep fighting it? As you can see, everywhere we've been so far, look at the soil. And you know how, if you go down, oh, now look at this. Do you see the white stuff in there? That's the fungus. That's the fungal nets. They're like little white threads. <laughs> so you see like the white threads. <coughs> oh, I don't bother. <laughs> no, it, it's uh, it's also difficult because they are multi-trunk. But uh, generally, I'll look at one and just uh, because they seem to kind of do their thing for about 30 to 50 years, 
and then other stuff starts to come up underneath and usually shades them out and then they die off because they're really short of stature. However, sometimes, like uh, on top of West Cape Preserve or somewhere like that where it's super dry, you're never going to get a bigger forest and so they'll never be shaded out. These bushy cedars will continue to grow and develop these like look like octopus, you know, octopus plants and very, very like sinewy and twined and really, really cool looking. And for that, like with the city of Austin, just for general uh, age, and sometimes you can just like take like the three biggest uh, trunks, measure that, divide it by three, and then just come up with the average. You know, so it's like you have a trunk this big, this big, and this one. There, there is, uh, there's one like that though that is on my uh, property that I used to live on in Dripping Springs. We call it Captain. It's hanging off of a cliff. And its trunk is about uh, 36 inches wide. Wow. And it is one of those, but it does have a well-defined trunk right before it starts to branch out. And when you jump on it, it doesn't move. It's rock hard. And I bet you anything, that tree is at least 600 years old. I mean, that bam, that wood is like concrete. It's like Ipe or something. And, you know, because when you go up to like a, the bushy cedar and you push on it, it's a soft wood. It's very sappy. There's a good, there's a Chinook yeah, right here. Yeah, so when we were talking about before it being uh, cut back there, that had that little ring, that's what they look like. That's a Chinook, also called scaly bark oak. You can look at the trunk, you know, the bark is almost like a pecan, you know, very kind of scaly. But do you see here, it's a mott. And uh, motts are normal. Do you know that an oak mott is not supposed to be a bunch of live oaks and that's it? An oak mott is actually a type of miniature forest that uh, is dominated by live oaks, but has mountain cedars, has uh, Chinooks, has Texas oaks, incredibly diverse. In fact, at the Labor Johnson Wildflower Center, they do a walkthrough, a tree walkthrough by Michelle Bertelson, who shows one oak mott that is how it's supposed to be. And there, the canopy comes all the way to the ground. What does that do? Protects all the Keeps big the deer away. Well, it keeps the deer away, but usually these oak mots are in the middle of grasslands. Keeps the grass away. Keeps the grass away so it doesn't burn. And I've also found mountain cedars, some old ones that are growing in the grassland that do the same thing where their branches come down. God, tell landowners, don't prune those up because then that tree's going to burn. And um, so then they take you to the next oak mot where everything's been pruned down. And she said, look how pretty it is, all the grass growing underneath it. And I raised my hand. You do know that's not a big old firebomb, right? <laughs> Susan Sugard, the mother tree. Yes. Well, and I also point out, listen to the birds. Where do you hear all the birds? Oh, they were in the first mot, the one that was messy uh -huh. and thickety uh -huh. because that gives them the cover that they want. And where do you hear over there? Blue jays. <laughs> uh -huh. Okay, here we're already getting older. Do you, okay, do, do you see how the branches here are no longer poker straight? Yeah. Do you see the curving? And even though this one is mostly dead, so that's not a good example. Here's got lichen growing on it. You're gonna see the lichen starting to grow on the trees that are probably like at least 75 years and older. But it's mainly, I mean, I can spot this out if I'm driving down the free highway at 75. Cause <laughs> like, do you see here, they're poker straight. And you look over here, they just, they have that curving. They're starting to develop that sinewy attribute they start to twist and turn the one i sent you a picture of is as you come in her driveway okay you can show you can see it on the way out there's one big i one saw it twists. yeah and they twist because uh it mainly is like a response to wind it make it create makes them stronger yeah oh now here's a really twisted one look at this one that's amazing yeah so you can see it just twisting it, it strengthens it some people had the theory that it's twisting uh, to access different water, but that, that's not that's not the case. It's just this is strengthening it. Uh, I mean, look at that. It's just all my the original name for my book was going to be called Untwisting the Cedar, which I thought was clever. But I was everyone's calling me a tambourine shaker and tree hugger, so I said I got to come up with something a little more. Uh, Want you dead and alive, you know? <laughs> <Grabs him. laughs> so, uh, but
But they're so pretty when they're like this. Yeah. This is, and a lot of people say, oh, they're ugly. And I'm like, then you haven't seen the older ones. They're picturesque. I wouldn't say that they're beautiful. They're picturesque. What now? This one looks like it's braiding into a Oh, it is. It's braiding itself. That's going to look cool in about 50 years. Mm -hmm. Well, that's the problem. We cut them all down, and so we don't have any of those <sighs> really young ones. I know. We don't give them a chance. I mean, okay, there's a nice little pioneering thicket right there. Do you see it all? Mm -hmm. psh, 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 psh. That's probably about 15 years old. Right there. I can just tell. <laughs> you do get to the point where it's just intuitive, really, and you're just like, yep, that's what it is. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. I don't see any here, but that winter storm we had last that, winter that was so violent. A lot of the cedars, they, um, their limbs broke, so there's hardly a threat, but they're still alive. Those oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Like, yeah. yeah, so don't survive. take them out know, completely. With so little oh, trees. trees. Trees are resilient. Oh, my goodness. And, and plus, when their branches fall on the ground and stuff, you want to leave those because that provides wildlife cover. Mm -hmm. And also, it's a place on any slope that will slow down erosion. But something else is that if you notice that during the ice storms, a lot of the trees fall over. But most of the trees that fall over are those that are in the open, that have had everything taken out from around them, or that have been limbed up. The lower limbs, a lot of times, until they're stronger, are going to actually help support, support those upper branches. So, and also, I have found that when, and, a, a woodland is over clear <laughs> when a woodland is over clear <laughs> that wind starts to blow through and that will knock over these trees you have to understand most of these trees in hill country are on top of thin soil they don't have you know, it's a big series of an anchor root so they need those other trees around them and that's another way to convince people to not overly thin their forests and woodlands is that it gives support they support each other we United got over there. Is that Texas persimmon? <laughs> looks like a persimmon. Or is that another yopon? I don't have my long distance glasses. Yeah. Sure about my long. There's a lot of yopon in here. The yopon. <laughs> it is another one. Yeah. I thought at first it might be a persimmon, but I haven't seen any Andrew, persimmon. Andrew, you picked it out. <coughs> yopon. Yeah, it's mostly agarita and yopon. We're That's the primary understory. This is strange. Yeah, it is. It's not an elbow bush. It's, it's not no, a toothache tree. Oh, I got some, uh, fe I got some female elbow bush. I'm so excited. Uh, okay, so I was saying that, you know, about 30 to 40 years is when the sapwood becomes less sappy and less sticky. And so, it, so then it's about 40 to 60 years old is when its bark will start to loosen up enough for like the warbler to be able to pull okay. at. The warbler is this big, yeah. it can't pull it off if it's sticky, so right. it, can, it, doesn't, it can't do the sticky stuff. And almost every nesting wildlife in the hill country uses that bark. Yeah. Uh, it's, everything yeah. uses it, uh, ringtail, yeah. ring you know, yeah. the mice, everything. Uh, turkeys, wild turkeys will use it. And, uh, <clears throat> it's like you, you can't manage your property for the warbler only. You got to manage it for the entire ecosystem. You know, it all works together. And so, uh, you know, people will say, "Oh, I can just have one of these per warbler habitat." I'm like, "No, <laughs> yeah. no, then it'll be because then once its bark is stripped, it, then it'll die." So here, here's a big one that has clearly died, probably from the drought. But you can see its form very well here. And again, you leave stuff like this and vines will start to grow on it and, you know, wildlife will kind of get underneath and as the stuff starts to fall to the ground. Again, you know, we need to get people to stop cleaning up everything and to keep it messy and controlled messy though, right? It's oh, like the stuff right at your house can be more oh, yeah. controlled. <laughs> <laughs> Has anyone seen any moss or nos talk? Oh, here we go. This works. I knew there had to be something because you were just mentioning about the water flowing down. <coughs> um, right here, you'll often see, this is, a, oh, this one here looks like resurrection fern. Anyone have any water you can squirt on there? Yeah. Do you think that's the resurrection fern? How much water do I need it for? I don't know. Just, and sometimes it doesn't oh. go right away. Sometimes it takes a little bit of time. The oh, yeah. nice talk will kind of green up real, you know. Yes, yeah, so he's already opening up. Yeah. What is that called? Uh, a resurrection fern. It's like when she poured water on it, it opened up. So, 
Yeah. Yeah. Do you see how it's all tied between you poured the water and opened up? I watched it after a rain and I saw that. Looks like it You'll see this wherever there's like, this is another indicator that you have subsurface moisture. And if people are asking, oh, it, this would be a place to indicate if a landowner wants to figure out where there might be a spring or something, is that you look down slope of something like this. So you look for these little moss, green uh, resurrection ferns and green mossy things and other things like that. <coughs> and many times I find them around mountain cedar trees. Which, you know, it's like there's many springs that come out from the base of mountain cedars. Mm -hmm. there's, there's this one that uh, is on top of a hill over in Spicewood, and it puts out 500 gallons of water per day average uh, on a, a yearly average, and it's surrounded by mountain cedars. They're about 75 years old. 500 gallons of water per day from the top of a hill. It's mind-boggling. Do you think that might be attributable to the added porosity? In the Absolutely. I mean, it has to be, you know, and uh, because another hillside near there wasn't producing anything and it had been cleared and just had sparse grass. And I love grasslands. Every time I go on one of these, uh, like, Zoom meetings or webinars and people introduce themselves and people say, oh, I love grass. Oh, I love trees. I'm like, I love grass and, and trees. <laughs> and, and understory trees. And the understory. It's like, you know, it's like you got to have it all kind of coming together and working together. But this would be an area that, you know, okay, it is a little bit open right here. It'd be so cool to see if you could get some like Lindheimer muleys growing around here and that kind of thing. I, I would even expect to see like some dwarf palmettos or. That's where you go find dwarf palm meds up on the hillside is where you have that or if you suddenly see a little cluster uh, of cedar elms, mm -hmm. not just one or two, but like a cluster of them. Or you see a, a weird out of place cottonwood tree on the hill, you know for sure you've got that springs. <laughs> there are a lot of people that say that, that the hill country was kept open like a grassland um, by fire. And uh, first of all, it, it's like in all my 25 years of research, I never ever came across one instance where fire was regularly being used. Now, for that matter, I did speak to both Leapon Apaches and Tonkwas, who said, yeah, we occasionally use fire as needed. You know, it wasn't like a big thing. Mm -hmm. But like, for instance, uh, Leapon Apaches would have used around the headwaters of the San Saba River because that's where all the, the tributaries braid out. That's what the buffalo like, because there's so many, they can spread out and they all get some water, right? Uh, why would you burn everything in the hill country if you have no horses and it's all broken terrain? Wouldn't you want to burn to bring them to you? Mm -hmm. That just makes so much more sense, as opposed to burning everything all the time. Now, in the Great Plains, because it was more open, it was easier to, to move through, they were burning more often. but <clears throat> there's not even fire scar data that people were still been looking at fire scar data and still are not finding this regular mm -hmm. burning cycle until the Europeans got here and the Germans started burning a lot because that was part of their culture from Europe and that regular sometimes they were burning twice a year and that continued up until about the turn of the uh, like until like the late 1800s um, the hill country, the fires would have occurred, but they've been very patchy and erratic and might have burned down one area of like Chinooks and then the black cat vireos came in. You know, and so things were always changing. It was very dynamic. So you, when people say, oh, the historical fire return was every three to 12 years, I do not support that at all. In fact, they're now showing that regular high frequency burns over a few decades are de depleting the carbon from the soil. So even though a fire initially occasionally used will replenish surface carbon, over the long term it starts to deplete the carbon. So that's something to definitely be aware of that you can use. I think that fire should be used more as a restoration tool, not as a management tool. That instead you get the livestock on the property and let them eating down and pooping and all that, that that is what is maintaining the grass on a more regular basis.
But, but I think I, you said, and I think Michelle said, <coughs> there's certain areas that are just na naturally grasslands and certain areas that are naturally woodlands, <coughs> right? No, not in hill country. It's always changing. It's always cha mm -hmm. You can't say that about it. Now, what you can say is that areas with deeper soil seem to kind of, grasses do better where the soil's deeper. Because where it's like this, the grasses, their roots have a trouble getting the, their roots down deeper. They don't have the strong roots of woody plants. So they kind of need the trees there and latch on to them. They can't just go out and blaze it alone. It's very hard for them. Um, <coughs> but in, where you have the soils are like three to six feet deep, then the grasses there can thrive and all that. But still, there were trees always as a part of that. In fact, the hill country vegetation was said to be prairie. But the word prairie back then did not mean a grassland. The word prairie back then meant an area of grass surrounded by trees or associated with trees. So that you have to understand, and I, I didn't know that until I, I pulled out some old, old dictionaries, <laughs> you know, went back to the source and just found them. I'm like, oh, that's <laughs> the meaning has totally changed, just like the word invasive has changed. And so when you're reading all these historical accounts, if it says it was prairie, as far as I can see, yeah. That's right, it was. And there were trees there. <laughs> and there were trees that were part of it. And they may even sometimes say, we went through a small prairie and re-entered the forest. Okay. Meaning, you know, it wasn't, the word prairie was never applied to the Great Plains. That had its own name, plains, because there were no trees. Mm -hmm. Delano Estacado is called that, because that means staked plains. They had to dry stakes in and over there going because there were no trees. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and had to do that here. In fact, when all the people settled in the hill country, when the Spanish uh, missionaries came through in the 1700s, they built the missions using the mountain cedars to, for the roof beams. They were big trees. And so the trees were already here. So anyway, so there were very, very large trees back then, and that was common. And I have found areas, like there's this one little remnant, uh, old growth cedar break forest in Oak Hill. And these cedar break forests, they were called breaks because um, that was an early term applied in like the 1700s, 1800s to densely packed vegetation of any kind, like a cane break, uh, cypress breaks, uh, because the cypress trees would come up so thick and dense in the swamps. I've seen pictures of them. They're packed in, but those trees are huge, but the cane breaks are you know, a lot skinnier. And when they got to the hill country, they called it cedar break because it was the same way. And I have seen some remnants of these that gives you a snapshot of what that looked like. Mm -hmm. And I think that <coughs> before they're all cut down, that was the dominant vegetation in the 1800s when people got here. They weren't talking about bushes. There's no description of bushes. The lucky ever with his 600 acres had a nice cedar break on it. Exactly. Yeah, and that was the source of building and all kinds of stuff, fences. They never talked about bushes. We have flip-flopped everything. We have ruined it all. <laughs> well, if there were bushes, those were the ones they didn't cut down. The ones they cut down were the tall, skinny ones. Yeah, but even though when explorers were going through, they never talked about the bushes. They would talk about the wild turkeys roosting in the cedar breaks. Not going to happen with that. <laughs> you know anything about wild turkeys? <laughs> they do not go for that. That's not what they want. They want tall with horizontal branches. In fact, <coughs> in fact, these older uh, cedar break trees, they look more like ponderosa pine trees. And a lot of times people will say, oh, no, I have, oh, ah, there we go. There's one right there. Oh, just <laughs> now, it's lower branches. It looks like it came up in a lot of sun, so it developed those weird lower branches. But do you see how the branches are going out horizontally? Mm -hmm. That's how, that, that is how, that's a cedar break tree. That's what I call a cedar break mountain cedar. <laughs> it does. Mm -hmm. And see how much more open it's, it's, it has a more open canopy. And, uh, and so instead of having 10 to 15 bushes for every tree, you had one one of these for every 10 to 15 bushes. So you had less pollen. <laughs> you had fewer fruits and everything, but you had deeper roots. You had better soil. You had, it, it was just, it, it, there is this uh, property in Oak Hill and um, we're still working. It's owned by Austin Watershed. 
and it has a remnant snapshot, even includes like three old eastern red cedars mixed in there oh, wow. because it's right in the convergence between the two. <coughs> and you go in there and you're like, now I know what it looks like. That's what it's is supposed there, is to be. That in your book? Uh, you betcha. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Where I talk about the cedar breaks, yeah. I, I'll say, I think I say it's in Oak Hill. But those are all black and white pictures to see it in color. I mean, every time I walk through there, I all can say, oh, my God, wow, this is it. And you see it. And we need everyone to see it, even though it's like five acres. But now that I found out, I thought it was owned by some, like, recluse rancher around on the other side of the fence that no one ever met. And turns out I finally looked on a property map and realized, oh, wait, it's owned by the city of Austin, by the watershed protection, which means we can get access. So. Yeah, that's great. <clears throat> yeah, so it's it's just it really and up on the slope, it, it turns into those wild, sinewy, twisted mountain cedars with uh, a huge patch, uh, colony of madrone trees. Oh, wow! Absolutely stunning. Yeah. yeah, and people don't realize the madrone is another one that depends on the cedar. Absolutely, oh. it one for it being a nursery tree, but also you know people always say it's so hard to transplant and grow them. I think it comes down to that mycorrhizal fungi, which that uh, I mentioned at the city of Austin, they had just uh, got a person coming from Arizona who's going to f study on the mycorrhizal fungi relations of different species, and one of them will be the madrone tree. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, so we finally might be able to get the answer to that, of what really is going on. Why is it so hard? Why do they have to come up underneath here? You know, it's like, uh, what, there's like three orchids that only co you know, come up underneath mountain cedars and all that. Um, It'd be nice, it could be here after like a rain to be able to see if there's any like fairy fingers, any kind of fungi, because a good time to go out to look at property is after a rain. Mm -hmm. For one, you're going to be able to see this mossy uh, stuff easier. You're going to see, uh, you all know what the NOS talk is? I haven't seen any, but that's a good thing. You actually don't want to see NOS talk. And what is that? <coughs> It looks like black oil on the ground, oh. like dried up black oil. I've seen that. You've seen it after a rain? Yeah. It looks all like weird seaweed. Slime, slimy. Slimy. Oh, <coughs> we don't want to see that. Because that is na that's nature's last ditch effort to get something to cover the ground. Huh. Nature wants to keep the ground covered. We have a couple of um, burn piles. Oh, that would be prime for yes, them. Yes, <laughs> and that's exactly where I see it. Yeah. The yeah. developer came in like 10 years ago, yeah. and these burn piles are still <sighs> dead. And, but I see yeah. that stuff. And what's it called? Nos talk. Nos talk. Yeah. And uh, so it will, when it's dried up, it, you know, it covers the ground as part of the, the crust of the earth. You know, it's these like little crusts. Mm -hmm. The earth has these crusts everywhere. And the more degraded it is, the more you see it. But we don't see that here, which is good, because we got soil, and we have other things covering the, the earth here. But um, it is a remnant. Remember, this used to all be under the ocean. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like a remnant algae from that that evolved. I uh, <laughs> attended a talk by E.O. Wilson a few years ago. Oh, wow. And he said, if you removed everything on the earth except for the life underneath the soil, you would have an exact copy of the world. Ah, interesting. <laughs> I like that. Yeah. Yeah. And, and one more thing here, because you keep mentioning Austin Wildlands, I'm thinking for a fall workshop, we can maybe get Jim O'Donnell to show us around the balconies. Oh, the yes. Y'all shouldn't need to see it. Okay, that yeah. would actually yeah. be a good follow-up to this because they've been installing those contour yeah, bias whales. Yeah. Okay, so they're calling them bias whales. I'm trying to get them to say, please say contour because uh, engineers and architects use them in the city. And I said, we should call those urban bias whales and to call these contour bias whales because their bias whales are, are not meant, they're meant to drain. Right. We need to make sure people understand what we're talking about. So uh, contour bias whales. But from what I found out is that it's better, in my book I just call them contour swales. And I found out my friend who works with the EPA on grants said, no, the word bias whale gets the money. So I'm switching it out to now it's gonna be contour bias whale. So keep that in mind. <laughs> You have to go with the jargon mm -hmm. of the day. Okay. Where do we want to go now? Any, any thoughts on where we want to go? Well, what's the, is there, so this is another, this is another good stick cedar that's grown up into a tree mountain cedar. Real skinny though, it looks like at one point it probably had some other canopy around it to squish it up like that. Typically it will be more open like that one. That one's a great example of what you expect a, like a break mountain cedar to look like. 
But it looks like at some point that clearly it was cut. A lot were cut because you look at all the stick seeders coming up. In fact, more of those are starting to look more like uh, dog hair regrowth. Um, but it's okay because it's still part of the regeneration. But you see how rocky it is here. This would be a place where I would want to do a swale. And again, okay, what I was talking about before, contour bias swales require a mini excavator. It could get expensive, right? Uh, so you could just use the rocks. You could use cut brush mm -hmm. and just follow the contour. Uh, it's called a windrow when you use the, the cut brush. And you just, it's real simple to do. And that will start to accrete the soil behind it and slow down the water so it can start to soak into the ground because we need that water in the ground to increase karst porosity. And the side effect, less erosion, less downslope flooding. It helps to keep the plants more hydrated so they're less flammable. Oh, lots of good things come out of that. And it helps the wildlife and the soil biology. It's all interconnected. The problem we have is everybody wants that tomorrow. Yeah. I know, and that's the thing, okay, young people. <laughs> <laughs> Those are the oldest young people I know. They are old. Let me tell you, when I've been going around, I'm finding more and more young people are showing up at my talks because, and they know all about using biochar, mycorrhizal fungi, and all, you know, all these things that are more like, they're not so much cutting edge as a lot of them are like old edge. You know, using biochar draws off of the Amazon, the Terra Preta that they would do there. And I had this like, idea of, you know, we used to have cedar choppers, that are cedar, uh, charcoal burners in the hill country. Why don't we combine that with the windrow and instead sink that windrow enough and create a long linear charcoal kiln that because when the charcoal's made, it sequesters carbon from the air and puts it into the ground. That is much better than a prescribed burn. Okay? <laughs> so when you're talking about what can we do now, that's the kind of thing that we should be doing now. But it's very difficult because people still need funding, and the funding is still thing is very cow-centric 1950s. And, and even so, I could say cow-centric, but remember I already mentioned livestock. We need to actually get more animals on the land because we need to use them. We need to set up a whole network with landowners where, you know, we have the technology. Now we can use drones as like little drone cowboys or whatever is, uh, is to, instead of branding them, you tag the, uh, you put like little microchips into the, yeah. And then you have them go from ranch to ranch so you can get wide scale rotational grazing. So it's intuitive migratory grazing. And so you give an area of little blue stem two or three years to recover, and then you come back to it. So there's all these things that need to be done, and that's why you'll be starting up that, that nonprofit, to so start bringing all these ideas together. But anyway, um, so there, there are little tiny things, like I said, just setting up a windrow, but it's like we really do need more information out there. Like, okay, P. Van Dyke with Drought Proof Texas, he's the one who's been doing these contour bias whales, He's pretty much the only one. So, and I've talked to him. I said, would you be open to training? We need to have a system where he can train multiple people throughout the hill country, set up a large hill country wide network of people that can do these services. Or it's like a, a green cow compost in Dublin. They have, uh, they will uh, come and spray uh, compost tea on your property. But that's just them. Yeah, you know, we need more places like this, yeah? But what would we tell people who don't have the money to do things like this? A lot of That's like $500 for about 20 acres. You know, it, no, the, 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 no, it's that. So we, I guess it's incentive to, to spend a little money on their own. No, what we need to do is to get people like Texas AgriLife, mm -hmm. the county extension agents, behind us mm -hmm. so that then we can change how the funding is done because to date, they've been getting money for just simply clear cutting all the trees. We need to reestablish how they get the funding because we can't expect these landowners to pay out of pocket for all the damage that was done by previous generations, you know, exactly. that we need the help. And that's why these, uh, there's several groups I've been talking to, they're finding ways of how to do this, is how to get like credits, tax credits for uh, getting more carbon into the ground, you know, that kind of thing. So there definitely are a lot of things that are in the works right now. 
because right now that that's the biggest hindrance it's trying to get the money but until we can get these agencies and everything behind these better ways of doing things we're not gonna be able to get the funding so the first place really is to get these agencies to change their ways and Brad Wilcox who is with Texas A&M he's been doing a lot in trying to get Texas AgriLife to that better place but there's still politicians and things like that. You know, it's, it's tough. We, we have like a hump we need to get over, but I think once we get over it, then it'll be much easier to do all these things. We're trying to get the people behind us. Yeah. Well, that's what you have to start with. You have to start get the army going. That's what Bill Neiman, when they the American Seed said, he said you have to start, your, get your army first, and then you, because uh, you get the numbers, you get the larger voice. Grassroots, tree roots. Effort. It's like grassroots. <laughs> so, you know. Now that's a really big uh, Texas red oak back there. Joseph White with Baylor, he found out that um, that the Texas red oak does not carry fire very well in its canopy. So it probably also served as a fire breaks. And, you know, that's why, that, that's another thing that if you're doing contour bioswales, you can plant along those. But one good thing to plant them with is Texas red oaks. Let it grow up and then it creates that linear kind of fire barrier. Why'd they cut so many? Just because for firewood? Firewood. In the Forest Service, they've been saying that the red oaks are part of what's spreading the oak wilt. It's like the, the way they form mats. Uh, that that attacks those beetles that don't spread it from tree to tree. Yeah, but probably in degraded that. soils. They never mentioned the fact that the soils would have to be degraded for the oak wilt to get that bad. Okay. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Is that and because the thing is, is that Texas red oaks need good soil. Mm -hmm. They are not pioneering species, and if the soil is bad, they're going to suffer and probably get the oak wilt. They, no one ever mentioned anything about oak wilt 100 years ago. Right. And now, granted, it was there but not as large scale as it seems to be today. And remember I was talking about how the, the mycorrhizal fungi will coat the roots mm -hmm. to reduce the, uh, the effectiveness of it. Everywhere in the area I'm in, they've cleared all the cedar. I haven't, my neighbor hasn't, but everybody else has cleared <laughs> the cedar. And so that's where it is. Yeah. Right across the street. Yeah. Um, I mean, but whenever you see a big tall one down there that has good soil, they're fine. In that major drought, the red oak, almost all the red oaks died, and all of the blackjack oaks come along. Oh, major drought. blackjack they, oaks are cool. Yeah. Where's your property? It's um. Yeah, uh, blackjack oaks. North of Griffin Springs, uh, not far from Fifty. And you had a lot of blackjack oaks. I did have some. They weren't post oaks. No, the the forester guy was just there because he was talking to me about the oak wilt, and he said they're blackjack. I always thought they were post oaks. He said, no, I mean, blackjack oaks used to occur around here, but most of them are gone. The one that came with really close oaks. to uh, Barton Creek. Yeah. Yeah, I'm really close to Barton Creek. There's only just a few acres between. I, I, my land is four feet deep soil on the bottom because Barton Creek is not far away. And you have people clear cutting on either side. <laughs> oh, I've had all kinds of stuff around. Oh. Crazy. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I asked about can we yeah. still have all the people all in one neighborhood? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> and we're actually doing that one of the visits yeah. we're doing. That. I know. It's just it's just very tough because. Like I said, when people come in and they want to do wildlife exemption, they're told to clear their cedar. Okay, so they're told right off the bat, at least Hayes and Travis, like I said, I don't know about other counties. So they're told right off the bat that's bad. When they buy the property, real estate agents tell them that they're not native. You know, it's like, ugh. And that's been tough. You know, I've been wanting to get out a little bit more with the whole pandemic. Oh, wait, look what we got here. Sorry, I got distracted. Uh, Squirrel. <laughs> <laughs> this is a whip leaf gland. Uh, in my book, I talk about a way to look at the whip leaf glands. And What's the first word you're saying? Whip. Whip. Like whip. Whip. It's like little fishing rods coming off of the tips here. And do you see how it therefore spreads it out? See how the leaves are very overlapped? So it's very scale-like leaves. But here, because they're overlapped, you can see the little whip leaf gland. And there, yeah, I can see it. May not even need a microscope. I brought the microscope to look at this in case we wanted to look at them. <coughs> There's something also, if you get people who are saying that they think they might have eastern red cedars, uh, when we get back, I'll show you some pictures on my uh, on my iPad, so you can tell people. You know, no. Uh, hold on. 
I thought I had a micro, I'm pretty sure I had a magnifying glass in here. There it is. So you can do, if you want a really, really close up picture, you can use a digital microscope, but you can also just do this, let's see. Yeah, this is a uh, regular bushy cedar. <laughs> is, what are you looking for when you okay. And I, I'll also do bring pictures. I'll show on my iPad when we get back, just so you can see a better example. Is that you look at the base of each little leaflet. Mm -hmm. And if you look close, you know what you're looking for. It's, I can't point to it because then all you see is my big old finger. Um, is is at the base of it, you'll see a little bump. And the bump, is that's the whip leaf gland. And if it's perfectly round, then that is a full-blooded ash juniper. But if it's completely oval, and you only find oval, then that's juniper's ovata. But if you see a combination of the two, that's the one that Dr. Robert Adams was thinking might be the hybrids. And of all the studies I've done, Every single single trunk one, tree like one that I've looked at has had a combination of the oval and the round. Which makes me wonder, are the tree like ones actually a hybrid? You know, it's like it just makes you kind of wonder. You know, it's like, I don't know. And every single bush, every single bushy one, that multi trunk bushy one has always had perfectly round without a fail. Mm -hmm. No, that's what I want to do, and I've been reaching out to some people, and I think I might find someone at UT who can do it. If you know of anyone, that would be awesome. Uh, no one in the state. <laughs> yeah, there's a, a t professor at UT and supposedly uh, uh, my boyfriend's girlfriend's professor <laughs> and uh, she, in evolutionary bi uh, ecology, and he, she said, yeah, she was really obsessed with it's two different... Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> and um, is that she? She was like really obsessed with knowing if this uh, sunflower, you know, had two different subspecies. I'm like, that's the person I need <laughs> because it might just be a subspecies. Yeah. It could be a whole other species. But let me tell you, 25 years of working on this, I can't tell you how many landowners have called me to their property to show me like, this is a different juniper, and they'll show how it has like. Yeah, like the ovada, the uh, the sapwood is not white. It has a lemon color to it, and that's why some of the old timers call them lemon cedars. And it's beautiful wood. Uh, not as very many of them, but uh, anyway, it'd be nice to find out because it could actually change how we manage them. You know, it, it would change a lot. And I know that biologists who study the warbler are like not happy about the concept. But I'm like, well, what if the warblers are they just use the hybrids mm -hmm. that would be something i think interesting to find out <coughs> so what, what should we be telling landowners now at this point no don't go confusing them i'll, I'll tell you all but <laughs> let's not confuse all the landowners but i and when we get back i, I can show you uh i brought the microscope i wasn't sure actually i see oval And round. Okay. Yeah, okay, so this one looks like it's the round and oval, but it's just real squatty and but still single trunk. Um so anyway, so we'll we'll I'll discuss that when we get back. Cause then we can just maybe yeah, when we go in the house or something can we go in the house or I mean I brought a black box a broad black box if we need to set it up somewhere outside so everyone can look into it so it won't have all the glare. And uh, it would be easier to do it there. So I guess we really didn't need to haul that thing around with us, but it's not that heavy. <laughs> so you want to head back? Yeah, let's head back, and then we can look at those things. Any other spread questions while we're out here? From the birds or the cones or it's spread by the, by the fruits because every animal eats the seeds and the fruits, okay. even the deer. Mm, I love the smell of it, though. Yeah, the, the, and the mosquito wax things last year. Oh, yeah. oh, they're the big ones. The big yeah. They are, but the passenger pigeons, passenger pigeons used to be the big spreaders. When they disappeared, the American robins and cedar waxwings took over. Wait, what? Uh, so I have five acres in San Marcos. Yeah? 
forested. I've seen and I've looked it. at yeah. pictures of, of it from like 1953, and it was still forested. Yeah. Ooh. Um, but the ground is, it looks like a little bit better than this, but there's still a lot of exposed rock. And I'm wondering like what event happened to degrade the soil there where it wasn't. I'd have to see it. Oh, okay. It's, uh, how big are the trees? Um, there's some big ones. I don't know. They're, I mean, they're, there's some good sized cedar. Like there's some. Like 36 inch wide? Well, like maybe, I don't know how big this would be, but like. Okay, then it's very possible that it was clear cut as part of the clear cutting, there was a massive clear cutting that happened from 1870 to 1900. Okay. And from the size of it, it looks like it did not get clear cut in the 1950s. So we've had two waves of erosion. Only an LCRA person once told me that they think there was about 10 inches lost the first uh, wave, but five inches on average were lost in the 1950s. But based on the size, remember I said if it's about 12 inch, that means they're about 100 years old or so, which means that uh, they were all clear cut at the end of the 1800s, which would cause that degradation. And if it continued to be grazed and stuff like that, then that would con not allow it to recuperate. It's like you have to kind of remove the livestock. You know, we used to manage livestock where when the fences went up which guess what made the fences was the very tree that they were cutting down. But, you know, it used to be that, the, you know, that the, that the, you know, that they had open range. They would go from pasture to pasture to pasture so the grasses could recuperate. And we don't, I mean, if anyone has ever had little blue stem in a yard and you mow it more than twice a year, it just dies. Mm -hmm. yeah. It can't handle it. Right. And uh, so you ha it needs to have a break. And that's, it's probably, you're looking at the disturbance from back then. So, but if you have a really good forest and you have a good can canopy cover and is recovering, then you would want to, like any brush that falls down or something like that, is pile it in areas. You would want to start learning to identify plants coming up to put branches and stuff like that on them, protect them from the deer. You need to get that, because uh, you probably have pretty decent soil that's starting to recover, but putting windrows and things like that is the most that you would have to do. <coughs> it, it would be fairly simple to get it going back because you already have the structure there. Yeah, we just have to fight the deer. <laughs> oh, oh, so you have the deer. Okay, that's it. Fighting neighbors who yeah. fight the deer. <laughs> but it's, uh, well, it's, I mean, because the deer used to be out in the open. Now they're all hiding in the trees because we taught them with all the overhunting. It drove them into the trees, and guess which are the ones that survived? The ones that learned to hang out in the trees. And because in the past, they, sometimes they would be in herds of hundreds or thousands mm -hmm. because they were all together because the wolves and all that were keeping them together. Mm -hmm. Now they're all scattered everywhere, constantly like the livestock, eating mm -hmm. the same thing over and over and over. Mm -hmm. So yeah, you have to do things like uh, anywhere you can get some cut stuff or something like that. And sometimes, you know, maybe, you know, cutting down some of the like dead branches and then laying it on the ground and that kind of thing. It just, uh, or even the briars on smaller stuff, they don't like that either. <coughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, or like if you can, yeah, get some kind of briars and stretch them around. Trim back your agarita a little bit. Sometimes I find the agarita, if you trim Oh, agaritas will also be nice, good nurse yeah. plants. Yeah. Trim, it, trim it back and you could use these ones. Oh, there you go. Around just small stuff, even, you know, it's a, and also going out and getting like a roll of um, wire. Yeah, we've done that. You can yeah. do that on certain things and just kind of use some rebar. Just, just as yeah, on just some key things, because once you even just, what's even best is don't focus on like one thing, rather do like a, a whole section, section. Oh, okay. because it uses less wire. Right. And so you identify some areas, so learn those native plants coming up, especially if you have something like red oaks or shin oaks, because they'll make that thicket. And the minute that you keep the deer off of them, then they'll continue to protect other stuff. We've been <coughs> specific trees. Yeah, find so like how many acres like, you have? Five. So it's not very so, no, so maybe do like two or three, you know, enclosures uh, per acre mm -hmm. if you don't have a lot of brush. If you do have a lot of brush, then you want to use the brush, but the brush needs to be about five feet wide and four feet high to keep the deer from jumping it. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Which, a lot of everyone, y'all don't sound like you have as, as much of that. And that's where, like I said, wanted dead or alive, that's where you start to use these bushy cedars that you can, we, that's what we should, if you're going to be cutting, utilizing, you know, use that, you shred it, that kind of thing. But it's really, it's best for protecting vegetation and not shredding it, not burning it, so that it can be used, you know, dead or alive as a nursery.
because we need to get that reestablish all that understory. So the, the other thing is, that if it's a bigger <coughs> area, they'll jump in. But if you protect it a smaller area that's too small, they now that too. Them. That is another thing, and I don't know what, how big it needs to be for something like that. It, what he's saying is that if it's like this big of an area, they don't need five feet wide. You're not yeah. going to jump in because they have a problem getting in and out. They also don't jump stuff if they can't see what's on the other side of it. So like even just if you found like an old privacy fence, you could even use the pickets from that. Just wire them together and create like a little corral, you know? So <laughs> yeah, lots of ideas. <laughs> all kinds of things. See, we just need to consolidate all these ideas yes, in one place. Have actually been mutilating them. Like someone says, Oh, we have eastern red cedars and people will be convinced hundred percent. And I have to like take a little leaf sample, and as you know, uh, the mountain cedar, when you look at it real closely, has overlapping scales. <laughs> the images I'm going to show you are the images that I took using this. This is just like a small digital microscope. It's something that's easy to take out into the field, and you just turn it on and you just do it. And it's real simple. It's nothing. It's not like a heavy duty one that you find How in much the lab. Does that cost? Uh, this one was like 125. Oh, oh, that's affordable. It's yeah. not that much. Is and everything else like if that? I mean, I think it would be a, a good thing if y'all want to take out. And once we start learning more about like the fungi and stuff, we can be showing uh, landowners uh, the fungi because this should have enough uh, resolution to show that at least, you know, not down to the cellular level, but you know, just enough. So right here is a picture I took of a mountain cedar underneath the digital microscope. And do you see, this is the little leaflet right here, okay? Do you see how, you, you may have to get closer, the leaflet edge here has little s teeth along it. Do you mm -hmm. see the teeth? Mm -hmm. Eastern red cedar has smooth or entire. Where, where are the teeth? Do you see them right here? Oh, yeah, okay. yeah now I do. So it's okay. like they have like little spiny edges. Oh. Teeth on the and so that's a leaf, that's one leaf, yeah. Okay, so leaflet, leaflet, leaflet. leaflet. <coughs> yeah. So, this is the leaflet, so that's zoomed into it. And for this, you can't use a micro, uh, little handheld magnifying glass. Th this, you definitely have to use this because okay. you have to zoom in so much more. What's actually fascinating when I've been doing all these zoomed in studies, I start to realize how many little uh, it's like there's like do you see these? There's like little water droplets. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And that they're like little bugs and stuff running around and feeding on the water droplets. Oh. Yeah. It was cool, you know? It's yeah. like this whole other like microecology going on. Um, okay, so he, here, let me show you this first. Can y'all see this? Oh, yeah. It comes around. <coughs> okay, so that's the whip leaf gland. And see how it's a complete circle? Yeah. And that is always, always, always on a bushy cedar. Okay. What is the function of that plant? Oh, I don't know what the function is. It's just uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's just part of the. It's of just a physio. Yeah. It's just part it's of the physique. Of it's like, it. what's the purpose <laughs> of your elbow? You know, it's just. <laughs> <laughs> so, but it's just as a way to distinguish. Okay, mm -hmm. now look at this. Do you? Yeah. Oh yeah, it's oval. Do you see how they're oval? Mm -hmm. And this is from one of the hybrids. Because this one, now to find this, if you see one that has an oval on it, then you have to keep looking until you find a round one. And because it'll be intermingled, mixed all over the place. You can't say, oh, I found that one oval and assume it's ovata. <coughs> you have to, because if it is a true hybrid, you have to keep looking to make sure that there are no other round ones on it. If there are no other round ones, then it's ovata. But right now, the only ovatas have been found in the New Braunfels area and like uh, west of the Nuestas River Valley. Okay, so the chances of us like here finding Novato is pretty slim. So if you find oval, assume it's a hybrid and keep looking until you find the round one to confirm that it is truly a hybrid. And every single time I have looked, found the oval, I kept looking, I finally found some of the round ones mixed in. <coughs> that is, you see that over and over. If you do clear it all at once, that's when you definitely want to shred it because the shredding will at least protect the ground, okay? Because that is the utmost importance, is the focus on protecting whatever soil is already built up. <laughs> the other thing is to look at the age. If the bushes are like less than 10 feet high, they haven't been working long enough to really improve that infiltration. So you want to try to get people to try to 
keep them a little bit longer. Once they're about 20, 30 years of age, when they're about 15, maybe 20 feet tall, then they're primed for taking out because by then the soil's improved a lot and they've gotten to the point where they've uh, got that uh, mycorrhizal fungi jump started and other plants are starting to grow up. That's what makes more sense. But let's say that there's <coughs> also another parameter. is the depth of the soil, and I kind of mentioned that earlier, is if the soil is like three to six feet deep, it's going to be able to handle grass better. So you're going to want to do that separate in a separate way. And usually that's on your flat to rolling topography. You're going to want to manage that separately than if it's on a hillside. Because on the hillside, you need to try to tell people, well, let's keep the trees, as many trees as possible. Mm -hmm. Because that's where your soil is shallow. That's where access to the karst layer is more you have more of a contact with that, and the tree roots getting down in there, maintaining that par karst porosity is imperative. We've got to retain that. But like out here, where it's more shallow, uh, more level, and your soils are a little bit deeper, then you can manage it more to be more of a grassland. And but for that, if it's all bushy cedars, again you have to realize if they're like less than 10 feet high, there's a reason why they started to spread and you need to figure out what is the health of your soil. Uh, going underneath, first of all, do the squeeze test. <coughs> if you squeeze it and it cannot hold together, it's pretty degraded, okay? If it completely shows your fingerprints, it means there's still no organic matter because it's all clay. Mm -hmm. But you want that nice in-between, nice little round ball that you know, holds together nicely without being squished together. If it has a good consistency, there's other tricks also that I want to start teaching is that infiltration method using a can. And you can go on the internet, go on YouTube, and they show like a can infiltration. Get a coffee can, put it on the ground, and you measure how fast it's going down. I need to set up the parameters, metrics for what is a good rate for us if you have shallow soil versus deep soil. So we need to establish those metrics. And, uh, but once you can get people to figure out, you have to first figure out what is the condition of your soil? What kind of topography do you have? How deep is it? And if it is shallow and all that, I would say one of the best things to do would be to shred it. If you have to also understand that, um, that the soil biology might have changed to the point where it's going to favor trees more than grass. <coughs> That's where you would want to bring in someone like green cow compost they bring in cow manure compost. That's what the grass loves. So that tweaks it. That adds the bacteria into the soil that the grass needs. If there's not enough gra uh, bacteria, the grass is never going to be able to establish that nice, thick. You, when you know the grass is good. When you walk, you can't feel your foot hitting the ground. <laughs> okay? That's what you want. And to get that, you need to get the soil so it's deep enough and rich enough and has the bacteria in it so that the grass will succeed and therefore will sustain itself. It's like when the grasses get like that, they literally are act as bullies on the prairie and will keep out most woody plants. So you reduce any invasion because suddenly it's no longer degraded and not needed. Yeah, it was interesting. I cleared a, cleared a property and when the pepper and spice would be cleared most of the cedar, you would, you would be horrified. But one thing I noticed is in a drought year, you'd find a lot of the little cedars. Yeah. And in a, in a good year where the grasses had filled in, you didn't find them. It was real interesting. <coughs> yeah, in a property I, I managed for about uh, 20, I, I've been, a, I, I was there for t 10 years, but I'm still following up with it 20 years later. 20 years later, an acre where we kind of add a little bit of a cow manure compost and stuff like that. And before, 20 years ago, we, we went in, we hand pulled and took out every little live oak, mountain cedar, everything. 20 years later, there's still nothing in there. The grasses look tired. They definitely need to be rejuvenated. And for me, that would be mostly bringing in the livestock, eating it down, adding that manure to freshen it up. Because they need that. They need that regular recurrence. But our main trial there was just to see what would happen if we went for 20 years. Does that grass, if it's in healthy condition, does it need recurring fires? 20 years, it still had not been burned not been mowed, nothing. And because the grass was still strong and healthy, it, there's no new woody plants in there. Talking about slopes, so you said uh, 20 foot to okay. slope, you probably don't want to cut. Yeah, it. yeah, okay, so on the slope, so on the flat area, uh, yeah, you, and, and still I wouldn't do it all at once. You still, even on the flat area, I might come in and do about half of it. If it's a nice level, the rolling area, shred it down, 
or uh, you can even put the cut brush on windrows if you want to have a few more trees in that grassland, that kind of thing. So you kind of work with that. But on the slopes, um, it depends upon how degraded, like you, it just be coming in because you already have a healthy canopy and it's fairly matured and not a pine and thicket. So if it's a good re regenerating woodland, you know, just come in and do those things to encourage more of the understory to keep growing. If it is a pioneering thicket, that means it's degraded. You do not want to clear cut. Instead, as you come through on contour and you do these tw uh, like 10 foot wide swaths through it, and that's where you can lay those windrows. You can do rock gabions. You can do the contour bias whales. So you use these like linear on contour things that can also act as fire breaks. You know, fire break it would be used for a pioneering thickets while you would do a shaded fuel break within a forest. And that is removing up to, uh, from the ground up to about four feet of vegetation in a, you know, little bands so that you don't have the, the ground fires moving along. But it uh, doesn't sound like you have to worry about that just yet, but uh, <laughs> as you get more. Um, so on a slope, you never, ever want to clear out more than, gosh, I would say 75%. I, I would keep... You know, yeah. we get flash floods. This is not a place to be clearing all the vegetation out, and we've been doing it. And we can see it's, um, <coughs> I remember I was at David Bamberger's ranch, and, you know, they had this one hillside. Um, and I asked him, well, why, why were you clearing all the trees from that hillside? And he said, oh, and it wasn't him. It was the people taking us around. He said, oh, it was to get more grass for the livestock. And I'm looking through our binoculars. Well, well, sir, that's all seat muley, and the livestock don't eat seat muley. <laughs> 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 and they said, well, it was to get more water in the aquifer. I said, well, I also see lots of little bear caliche around each of the seat muley, so that's not really controlling anything. That means you've allowed it to be eroded down. Yeah, they don't like it when they go out there. But, uh <laughs> <laughs> but, so it, but it's because it's too steep, and even Bamberger will tell me in private that... Uh, this is not going to be so private anymore, but uh, is that, yeah, for one, he never, ever advocated removing all the cedar. Never. That's what the media has said that he has said. Mm -hmm. He does not say that. If you go talk to him, he never said that. In fact, there's a picture of him hugging a big one. He knows the value of them. And he also says his biggest mistake was using bulldozers. Mm -hmm. Chaining? Oh. But, but, but that oh, was back in the time when that was common. And yeah. he, yeah. It's the culture and back then. <coughs> because people didn't realize. But you can imagine how much that destroyed the karst. Mm -hmm. I mean, that would work if you had sandy soils, you know, or something like that. But in karst, it just destroyed that whole upper layer mm -hmm. of the karst and just annihilated it. And he says everywhere he used a bulldozer, it, it still looks horrible. Mm -hmm. and, and unfortunately, they don't show visitors that area. And I'm like, you should. You need <laughs> to sell them, show them that. But it didn't work. But, um, but even when you're going around to his place, you know, it, you have to remember when you're looking across the grass, it might look pretty. But walk um, around it. Like I said, mm -hmm. your feet should never touch the ground. That's when you know it's good. And even seat muley. Seat muley is a lot like mountain cedar. It's also the pioneer. <coughs> on extremely degraded conditions. It's one of the ones that, and, but it can also form an old growth colony. And I've seen a few of those, like at the Balcones Canyonlands Preserve, on a slope, I kid you not, like this, solid all the way down. There's wow. not one bare spot in there. And, and there's, see, oh yeah, and oh, there's wow. a spring at the top that yeah, flows down. Yeah, oh. <coughs> yeah but, but even from being on exposed, there's no canopy above it. And it's so dense and thick, it just, it's like Velcro, it just sticks there. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and there's just so zero that's erosion. What you want when a big rain comes. Yeah. To hold it down. We need mm -hmm. dense vegetation, whether that is a dense thing, a seat muley, uh, even just a dense pioneering thicket of, of mountain cedars. In many cases, that's the only thing that will grow. So we need to be thinking dense, not sparse. Everyone's been taught, no, you need sparse to increase the amount of runoff. Literally, I have bulletins put out by the USDA, by the NRCS that say you want to maximize runoff, clear off. You want, like, the, 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 I hate to say it. Yeah, Dr. Tom Thoreau back in 1990s was saying 
Yes, it would be ideal if we could remove up more than 70% of all woody vegetation in the hill country to ma and keep all the grass short. Oh, <laughs> That's what he said, we get more water in the aquifer, and that's a very, very tunnel vision. That's not a very uh, ecological. <laughs> <laughs> but he's a hydrologist, and that's all he was thinking. He was only thinking of that terms, and unfortunately, the media jumped on it and used that literally for it is. And, okay, you know the whole thing of, oh, they suck water from the aquifer. How much yep. water do they use? That was all based on Dr. Keith Owens' study of one juniper. Uh, one. Oh, wow. And uh, as you've learned already, I've talked about how variable the karst is. No water use is the same. And they have learned since then, uh, you can't look at one. You have to look at entire stands. Mm -hmm. And they have since then learned that, no, it's the live oaks. They're actually using more water. <laughs> and because when you look at the over multiple studies, but his very first one was just, he was just testing out a, a ways to estimate water use. He, it wasn't meant to be gospel. Mm -hmm. He said he pretty much was doing it while drinking a beer. You know, it was, yeah. it was casual. It wasn't meant to be this gospel, you know, and yet people jumped on it and had used it to apply it to every single tree out there. Even though once every single tree gets older, their water use slows down. And yet they're still applying that number to every single, they're applying it to one this big, every single mountain cedar, you know, but they just looked at one compared to one live oak. But the purpose, and even in this abstract, he says, yeah, this should not be applied to all of them. It even says that in the abstract. And yet no one reads that. They just no. read what they want. You know, just small. Yeah, they cherry pick. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Do you guys right. have any more questions? Mm -hmm. Wow, you guys must have more questions. <laughs> We're good? Um, oh, thank you. Have I answered enough? <laughs> no, I think I hit all the points. You know, oh, I'll, I'll anyway, over here, uh, people saying that they're alle alleopathic that they're killing. Do y'all get that from people? No. It, it's not. I have heard of that, but yeah. yeah, it's not. It, and it's been written up in lots of books. It's alleopathic that has ex a, a chemicals that kills the understory. Yeah. It's the deer. Oh, the, they're the, saying that the, the mountain, more, I mean, the ash <coughs> junipers are killing? The, yeah. Oh, but I just hear they kill everything. Cleared out underneath. Yeah, but it's oh, like no, but every no. time you see it, it's all been pruned up. I'm like, well, what about do you don't think the deer are just eating it? Yeah. <laughs> around an oak. Some people say you uh, clear six feet around the yeah, oak. Yeah, I mean, it, it all depends. It, 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 usually what's coming up underneath an established live oak usually tends to be the, the stick cedar. Well, they tend to be the stick cedars, which will be, remember I said that they will be a normal part of a mod, but we don't need that many, and this is abnormal. There's, it's an abnormal condition because we have thinned out the oak mods. So nature's trying to thicken it back up, but we don't have to keep all of it, right? So I'll go in. Anyone that's like forked down low, you know, comes up straight and has a low fork, that's not going to make a good tree. So you thin out those. Um, I, and I will, I'll get a little bit more space around the base of the live oak. If one is coming up cl closer to live oak, but there's like no canopy right above, I'll leave that one. Mm -hmm. So kind of pick and choose and keep more of them on the south and west side because that will add more shade for the live oak and the live oak will be very happy with that. Mm -hmm. So keep more on the south and west. You can uh, thin them out up to 50%, but don't do it all at once. Do it and then go back, you know, five years, 10 years later, take out another 50%. And so you're just kind of coaxing along because if you take it all out, what's gonna happen? You're not gonna get any more understory. Mm -hmm. So those also act as nursery trees. So you don't want, don't take all of them out. But get the live oak a little bit of girth and, you know, no sense keeping the ones that have, aren't formed right. Just selective pruning, thinning rather, until, you know, they grow up. What other kind of comments or questions do we get from landowners? Yeah, I think the biggest one I get is that, uh, you know, the whole messy thing is that um, it, it, I, I, I want to come out here and make it pretty and, and then I need to trim it up and um, my neighborhood, they call it lala topping. I know. Yeah. So the, <laughs> and they raise the canopy, and now my now my view is good. And yeah, people are really obsessed with the view. Yes, yes. And I, I'm not exactly sure what's the best way to address that. That's more of a psychological I, issue. I think it's balance. I'm just trying to talk them into is is explain the benefits of the natural ecosystem 
and then just carve out a little space if you want to urbanize it, but yeah. find the balance. Well, that, that, okay, yeah, and I was just meeting with a landowner in Driftwood a few weeks ago, <coughs> and he had, a, and this was just with live oak, he had a, a live oak moth that had been mostly butchered, and you know how they get all those little things at the bottom because oh, they're yeah. trying to reestablish right. it. And everyone keeps mowing them back down and yeah. it triples and triples and triples until it's a mat. And there was about 10 that were coming up. And I said, oh, wow, look, it's, 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 forming a new, it's reforming a mot. And he said, oh, I'm getting ready to cut all those down. I said, well, why? So first I asked him why. Yeah. And his thing was, oh, well, it blocks my view. And he has, that was his one view shed. And I said, well, you know what, actually, these three here would block that view, but these three are actually bending in that direction. They're growing in that direction, so they're not going to block the view. If you're sitting, where do you want to see the view from? Right. Is it while you're sitting on the patio? If it's when you're sitting on the patio, okay, let's sit down here. Let's see what really needs to be taken out. It's like when a developer goes through and they clear out all the vegetation. And I'm like, why don't we build the house first and then just clear out where the windows are? <laughs> The other thing people forget you is know? the sound barrier aspect. Oh, I know. I have the tra uh, my property is here, and then there's another property between it, and then there's a transfer station. And before, that property was covered with cedar, and I could hardly hear the transfer station. Mm -hmm. and that That's an incredible oh, sound buffer. Bro uh, yeah, cool. well, that foliage, yeah, because yeah. it's so tiny and all that deflects, deflects yeah. and absorbs the sound. It's an excellent sound buffer. So it's people forget that they have a privacy, and uh, it's privacy and sound barrier. Mm -hmm. This reminds me of, a, in Austin, you know, they have a view corridor. Yeah. There used to be law, a law that you couldn't build Capital. taller than I that. know. Mm -hmm. And now the place has I all these know. factors. I know. But they still have view corridors to yeah. find where you can see the Capitol. Yeah. So you don't have to clear all the land. <laughs> you just pick, pick your view. And I know. It's out. like, it's trying to teach people, like, you don't have to see everything. And, uh, of course, with snakes. Try to get people to maybe just mow 10 feet out from the house. Mm -hmm. And it's just say, yeah. yeah, and it's firewise, mm -hmm. you know, so it creates like that uh, firewise <coughs> buffer, you know, and, and if people are saying also on the flammability, it's more about you know, mowing that firewise buffer, but also just trimming up the ladder fuels. You know how the, the, the bark on the mountain cedar is real shredded. Mm -hmm. If it's older, it can have the strips, pieces are hanging. Mm -hmm. Cut those off, you know, if you're in that, you know, with it closer to the house, because that could be a ladder fuel, mm -hmm. you know. Is, and that would help also clean it up, you know. So there's <laughs> ways to clean it up without getting rid of it. Yeah. <coughs> because you don't, and you don't, try to say, if you have three bushy cedars, try to get them to keep the one that's the furthest away, uh, and, and, or go in there and say, Oh my God! Look, there's a black cherry coming up. Why well, don't we keep exactly that? Exactly what we try yeah. to do. Go through and yeah. Like, oh, look what I found. Oh, this is. Uh, this I, is know. So I know. I know. And it, it works about half the time. I did have this another person I talked with, and I was so excited. I dragged him over. and Said, "Look at the black cherries! Oh my gosh!" I said, "I said these tr mountain cedars are enabling it. Let's keep them there until they're higher and all that." The next week on Facebook, he showed pictures. Oh, oh yeah, I cleared them no. all. And then a week later, the deer ate them. Oh, yeah. yeah. So it's wow. like, tell them that it's a nursery tree. I, I was just going to write a note on that, because I heard you use that term early. It's nursery, and I yeah. like that. Yeah. And people, people are, uh, they like that word. That's a good mm -hmm. word to use, nursery. nursery. It's nursery. It's nursery. Maternal. Maternal. <coughs> yep. yeah. Well, but the cedar's taller than the oak. It's going to kill the oak. Do you have, do you have any... Do you ever say anything? No, it, if they're both large, tell them that they both access completely different water supplies, that the live oak roots yeah, are tw two times that. deeper, that they have evolved over a millennia I to know. grow side by side. They also use water at different times of the day, so there's no competition. What time of day do cedars use water? Because I know oaks do first thing. I think it's like afternoon or something like that, but, but it's like they're not like at the same time. And even throughout the year, it's like the mountain cedar water use is a little more consistent while the live oak is all over the place. You know, so it, it's like, it, it, but there really is no competition. It's just in our brain because we've been taught the trees are so bad, we think, oh, it's going to harm the live oak. But no, actually it's benefiting. Tell them it's actually maintaining our 
the uh, mycorrhizal fungi that's, yeah, that's benefiting it. Well, it increases that <laughs> network. <laughs> yes. what it does. It it, oh, it helps prevent them from getting... No, no. Oh, yeah, but, of course, most landowners are going to glaze over, right? right. No, when yes. you tell them, it's going to pre reduce the chance of oak wilt. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, I, think, I, think I think that's... Yeah, Jim O'Donnell exactly. once in one of the <coughs> webinars I listened to, he said that they had some preliminary evidence that it may, that may be true, but they haven't proved it, that it does keep... Well, yeah, no, I talked to Lisa about that, but no, I mean, I read that, I've read that, that that's what they do. It's not just with Jim's research, but uh, no, I've read that elsewhere. Oh, yeah, yeah, that it coats the roots, and uh, now there still is research that needs to prove it. No, that the, I wasn't saying that, the, the, that, the, that the, red, the cedars actually protect the live oaks to some extent. Oh, uh, I would just, yeah, no, I mean, it's like, it's just, that's something that, yeah, that's what the, uh, the research scientist that's come in, she's going to be studying those relationships. Yeah. So before long, we should be able to have the hard stuff on that, but every arborist that I know, any good arborist will tell you that, yeah, that the minute that you start taking out mountain cedars and even other trees, what happens is that then the live oak roots will join together. And then that's where you get the oak will gets tr uh, transmissions through the ground. It's like, you know, one of the biggest treatments, you cut a trench, right? Well, just keep the tree, other tree species in between them. That keeps them from so netting together. Because it's a very <coughs> small part of my land that the trench is just going to go between the yeah. lands. And um, uh, if I plant other species of trees in that, yeah. it's about 100 feet. Yeah, that will help that keep will help the live oak roots from, apart. Right, that makes sense. Yeah, so it just acts as a barrier. There's a huge outbreak of oak wilt in two spots in the area that I'm in, and I've been watching it over the years and how it's where it's chosen to go. Yeah. And it's consistently chosen to go where the cedar has been cleared out, and I haven't oh, thought yeah. about that. Yeah. Because there's some, one place that's almost surrounded that one place, but they don't have any of their cedars clear. Yeah. And and the live oak they did trench years ago there, but none of that, and it's gone over multiple trenches other places. And it's just fascinating. Well, and you know what else I've also noticed, is, and now this is more of an urban and suburban observation as opposed to a rural observation. In suburban and uh, rural you know, urban areas, you know, they mow a lot, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <coughs> and they mow and they mow and they mow, and they don't let regeneration happen. And what? so I've seen a, a neighborhood just get wiped out, all of their large live oaks, but I had one client who had not been mowing her live oaks for a while. She, she had all these sprouts that were about this big. Mm -hmm. None of them died. Mm -hmm. So it, it's like the young ones will survive, so you can also increase the resilience by not by allowing different ages of the trees to come up mm -hmm. and not keeping everything so neat and tidy all the time. Right. Mm -hmm. It's like we like want everything, all the overhead shade canopy, but nothing underneath. Well, it's, yeah. Sorry. So anyway. Was, the other thing I noticed when I moved here from New Jersey, was it 20 years ago or so? You know, New Jersey I grew up in, and everything is the same every year. And I realized in Texas, no, some things look good one year and some things look good another yeah. year, and you got to get used to the fact that it, it changes. Yeah, Different. yeah, yeah. Nature's always changing. Yeah, yeah we have a pretty, uh, yeah, well, I went to college in Virginia. I noticed that, yeah, it was pretty predictable and all that. And, uh, you know, when I clear cut in Virginia, what, the soils are, what, like 20 to 30 feet deep? <laughs> And so you'll get a new forest within 60 years. It'll look exactly like it did before because the regrowth is so fast because there's, the soil is so healthy and strong and wow. deep there, and they don't get the flash floods to wipe it all away. And because the other problem also is, is that when you clear cut, and you get the, you don't, you're not just losing the soil, but you're using, losing the seed bank. Mm -hmm. You know? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Well, they're getting the floods now. Uh, they they just, sure are. Recently, so it's years. going to start changing things. Yeah. <laughs> Not going to be as static. So. The cardinal in the room. Yeah. yeah. Well, don't, I don't don't imagine the I've been listening to all of it since yeah. we've been here. Most of all, uh, yes. I thought that was her squirrel. It was all these birds. Oh, do you? Christina and Lance are going to send me some pictures. <laughs> yes. Sure. This was wonderful. Okay, so y'all feel like you're ready to get into the field Thank and you tackle everything. Oh, man, yeah. I'm going to take a picture of your um, machine here because I've been looking for it.